Hey everyone, this is Adam Ellenboss from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Monday, everybody. Today, we're going to take a look at Venus's upcoming square to Neptune, which is taking place, by the way, as Mercury is moving into a trine with Jupiter and as the Sun is conjoining Pluto and both are moving into Aquarius. That's all happening right around the same time at the end of this week. In many ways, this week is a story of building up to that. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start today by sort of looking at all of those things happening simultaneously around Friday of this week and uh, prepare for it on an archetypal level. We'll, we'll turn the jewel of these different uh, planetary combinations and uh, hopefully give you a sense of what to expect from them. And then as the week goes on, I think what we'll do is we'll continue looking at Pluto into Aquarius, the Sun and Pluto, Venus, Neptune, uh, and even Mercury and Jupiter, all of which, again, are coming at the end of this week. So there's a lot of room for us to um, go pretty deeply into this uh, moment, which is one of the bigger moments of 2024, even though it's a very young new year. This is one of the most important sequences that's happening with Pluto's ingress into Aquarius. So anyway, that's our goal for today. Before we get into it, as always, uh, don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel to grow. If you take just two seconds and click the thumbs up button, we really appreciate that. If you're new to the channel, I hope you'll subscribe and stick around. You can find a transcript of any of my daily talks, including today's talk on the website, which is nightlightastrology.com. Don't forget that this week, our new masterclass series begins on Friday. Uh, you can attend those live or you can participate remotely. The masterclass of the winter season is on the fixed stars in ancient astrology and getting to know them. If you're new to using the fixed stars, this would be a good uh, course that teaches you both how to use them and gives you a little bit of uh, deeper insight into uh, some of the fixed stars that I use in my practice and uh, chart examples and stuff like that. So anyway, if you need uh, tuition assistance, you can find that on the website, nightlightastrology.com. All of our classes offer sliding scale tuition. If you are hurting financially, we understand. Please feel free to take advantage of that. Our year three course just began last week. It's not too late to jump in on that. And our moon circle, Roots and Spears, also just started meeting last week. You're all welcome to jump in on any of those if uh, you'd like to and you're late, late to the party, so to speak. Check out all of those under the courses page of the website and uh, feel free to ask us if you have any questions, info at nightlightastrology.com. All right, well, let's take a look now at the real-time clock and let's gather our thoughts here. So we're talking about the seeds of ingress. Just like a new moon is um, an astrological event that requires us to look at the total context of not just the sign that the moon is in, right, but the total context of what's going on in the sky around the time of a new moon because the new moon is like a seed and it bears the implant of everything happening in the sky at that moment which then generally speaking ripples out like waves from like a, a gong or throwing a rock in the water and seeing the ripples spread out across the water of, of a pond we want to understand what's happening at the time that really big events are happening in astrology uh, around the big event so uh, for example, this week, Pluto's entering Aquarius. Okay, great. That's a huge seeding moment when Pluto ingresses into Aquarius uh, for 2024. This will set the tone. And for many of us, this will be a significant time, not just because one event happens, but because this, it's a seeding point that carries with it a lot of different archetypal signatures that will start spreading out as the year goes on, like the waves of the on the pond, on the surface of the pond. So what is happening around Pluto's entrance into Aquarius? Some really important details. Let's take a look at them. So as the week goes on, the most important thing that we're paying attention to is right here. This is Friday, and this is when a bunch of things come together all at once. And wouldn't you know it, my epic pen is missing. I swear to God, my epic pen has a uh, just such a personality. Okay, where are you? Where'd you? Ah, there you are. You're all the way over here. You snuck away from me. All right. <laughs> all right. Here is probably one of the most important signatures, uh, which is the conjunction of the Sun and Pluto at the last degree of Capricorn as the two are both entering Aquarius. So this takes place between the 19th and the 20th. This is Friday into Saturday. If I advance this by just one day, you'll see the Sun going in and later on the 20th, Pluto goes in as well, so that by the 21st, they're both squarely into Aquarius. But this actually takes place on the 20th. So 19th, into the 20th, they are conjoining and both moving into Aquarius at the same time. It's interesting that a Sun-Pluto conjunction is happening right as the Pluto ingress into Aquarius takes place. That is worth noting. That is a seeding, that is a contributing factor for the seeding moment that we're, we're talking about here. 
The other thing that's happening is Mercury in Capricorn is heading back right through the area where it's stationed to turn retrograde uh, in December. And then we saw the trine uh, to Jupiter at that time. And now that trine is back as Mercury is coming back through the initial point where it's stationed and turned retrograde. So we have a Mercury-Jupiter trine. And then finally, we also can see that Venus in late Sagittarius is squaring Neptune. And there have been a number of squares to Neptune in the past month or so that have been a really important part of the astrology we've been breaking down. Finally, it's worth noting that the moon will be exalted in Taurus as this transition is taking place, connecting with Uranus, but also going through a trine to the sun. This is a waxing uh a waxing gibbous moon right now. It's heading toward full. Uh, it's a little ways away from full, but uh, nonetheless, this is a uh, important detail because it really emphasizes the earthiness of the moment. It's a lot of earth uh, and a kind of culminating earthy connection before the sun and Pluto enter Capricorn. So if we were to take this a day out, you'll see that um, here we have, you can see the moon here. Actually, let me just do this. I'll back this up just a little bit. You'll see that the moon in Taurus, this is early Saturday morning, January 20th, that moon will go right through the Pluto sun conjunction as it is almost exact, right? So that, that's a, again, just emphasizing the Capricorn Taurus connection as a huge seeding portion of what the entrance of Pluto into Aquarius is doing, at least right now. Of course, we've got almost two decades of Pluto in Aquarius, so it's not to say that the entire uh, life of Pluto in Aquarius is toned by this moment. We're just talking about the power of the ingress at this time right now and what's, what are the surrounding circumstances that are contributing to the meaning of the ingress here in 2024. Okay, so those are the big things to consider, and they all take place between Friday and Saturday. So huge, huge period of time there. So what are what what do I, what do I put together from all of that? There are some other details I left out. For example, it's interesting to note that Venus, that Jupiter is in the domicile of Venus and the bound of Venus, right? That Venus and Neptune going through their square to one another are both in the sign of Jupiter in Taurus. Jupiter and Taurus is moving direct, heading toward that April 20th conjunction with Uranus and Taurus. Um, so there's there's a lot to be said about. A lot of the undercurrent of this has to do with uh, the Jupiter-Uranus conjunction that's coming up in just a couple of months, too. That's kind of um, underlying everything with such an emphasis on on Venus and Jupiter um, and Jupiter's upcoming conjunction with Uranus. So anyway, you don't have to remember all of that. This is stuff we'll be breaking down gradually over the months to come. But what are the seeds surrounding Pluto's entrance into Aquarius right now? Well, one of them, and you, again, again, because we're not just looking at Pluto into Aquarius. You don't put things, you can put things in a vacuum for the sake of learning, which is always a good idea. Like what's Pluto and Aquarius on its own as if nothing else existed, because then you can get into sort of like the substrata of Aquarius. And, and that's what Pluto wants to do is get down deep into a sign. So that's really effective. But Pluto and Aquarius is never in a vacuum. It's always in a community of things happening at the same time right now. Pluto moving into Aquarius is supporting something like a Venusian daydream. And I say daydream rather than dream because the nocturnal space of dreams is, it's something that um, is often a little remote or dissociated from our everyday life. It's a little bit more cryptic. It happens when you're sleeping. A daydream to me, the, the, the simple distinction I was trying to make by using the phrase daydream is the idea that we are starting to envision and imagine things that have a, a clear path to manifesting in the earthly, worldly, material circumstances of our lives. We're, we're, it's, it's more of a, a vision of something that we find beautiful or desirable, very Venusian, very earthy, very Taurian. Uh, and the reason for that, again, is that Venus is squaring Neptune this coming Friday. Uh, Venus Neptune is very, very dreamy, right? However, we have to remember that the ruler of Venus and Sag, Neptune and Pisces, is Jupiter in Taurus, turning direct in a solid earthy sign who's also in the domicile and bound of Venus right now. So this is about a new value, a new vision that's seeking that earthy, uh, everyday, practical um, manifestation. It's looking for 
uh, space to grow and take shape in our actual lives. It's more like I'm starting to see the way I want to redo a bedroom in my house. Not I had a dream last night about living in Hawaii and I wonder what it meant. Do you, do you see what I mean? Where dreams in the nocturnal space can be, um, they often allude to things. They, they often require a kind of hermetic uh, turning. Like let's turn that dream around and talk to it and see what it says and what it suggests. And, and, uh, and sometimes daydreams do that too, I suppose. I don't want to be too like rigid in the way I'm describing the difference, but a daydream here as I'm describing it is like, it's like if if you were to be I don't know you were out walking uh, around uh, you know in in a in a little village or something and you caught a, a a whiff of some kind of beautiful soup that someone was making and you go I'm going to go home and make that. It's something that's capturing us on the level of our senses, something that's capturing us on the level of our 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 physical embodied desires, and it's saying, "Ooh, I want that. I, that's what I want to create. That's what I want to go home and cook up." So there's something coming through that's overwhelming us, that's inspiring us, but that's seeking earthy instantiation. Like, let's take form, let's take shape. And this is the way I'm seeing it because, again, Venus Neptune is very dreamy, very, it's so rooted in the romantic, the subtle, the imaginative, the desire body. Uh, and of course, we can get captured by that in ways that are um, deceptive, you know, illusion and delusion can be part of that. But broadly speaking, I, I trust this a little bit more because of the fact that you got solid earthy Jupiter, um, you know, in Taurus, that's the underlying host of the Venus Jupiter, uh, the Venus Neptune dynamic on Friday. So a Venusian daydream, so, something we desire seeking uh, worldly embodiment. And then we also have to consider that Mercury in Capricorn is trining Jupiter in Taurus this Friday, Saturday as well. A plan, an incremental shift, a strategy, a strategy that is ultimately about what? About that um, new daydream. And the reason for this is that Mercury's trine to Jupiter is, remember, trines are of the nature of Jupiter, and uh, Mercury trining Jupiter will be doing so as Mercury moves into the bound of Jupiter, uh, and it is in also the, uh, it's in the exaltation of Mars heading into a conjunction with Mars and Capricorn. Mars is of course, just finishing the trine with Jupiter. So again, everything seems to relate back. I mean, Capricorn loves to build things and it loves to do so incrementally with long-term vision, patience, methodical, disciplined, uh, persistent efforts and focus. You know, this is why Mars is exalted in the sign. It's like someone who's willing to put in the work and sacrifice to climb a mountain. You know, it's like you got to spend a lot of time training. I, I was watching a documentary a couple of years ago about people who climb Mount Everest and like all this training that goes into it, like marathon runners do all this training leading up to the marathon. Mars and Capricorn loves to do that. You know, and that's where Mars is right now. And Mercury's heading toward the conjunction with Mars, who's just separated from Jupiter and Taurus. And now Mercury's going through that trying to Jupiter and Taurus and then connecting with Mars. So again, there's a kind of a plan, an incremental shift, a strategy. Let's let's move toward the goal. It's like, and you might remember me saying this somewhat recently around the new moon in Capricorn, where I said, we're trying to build something, but it's a Venusian daydream. I want to build a porch where people can gather. I want to build a bonfire pit where people can get together and sing around the campfire. I want to build a garden where beautiful things can grow. Um, and so the Mercury Jupiter connection is suggesting that we're planning and we're creating incremental shifts and strategies and we're building toward a greater understanding of something, uh, maybe intellectually, or we are uh, literally working methodically toward that kind of Jupiter and Taurus uh, that with the underlying emphasis on Venus, um, that, that daydream. All right. Number three, we're casting the ring into the fire. We're laying down the cross. This is Pluto culminating in Capricorn. You might remember back in, I think it was November or December, I did a talk saying, what's the cross we've been carrying as Pluto culminates in Capricorn? Uh, the, I, I've compared Capricorn recently to the, um, the narrative arc of the Lord of the Rings. If you know that story, um, the ring of power is something that has to be destroyed because it will corrupt anyone who tries to wield it. And the powers of this world so frequently 
will that will be the shadow side of Capricorn will be the corruption that happens when uh, the, the Capricornian individual or some Capricornian portion of your birth chart becomes enamored by the uh, the power uh, because it's a tremendous power. Mars is exalted in this sign. Um, and, and those things that you work hard on develop a kind of Shakti. Like if you sit and I don't know if you if you do anything day after day after day and you get really good at it, there's a kind of power that comes from it. And you have to be willing to look and say, well, I'm not going to become enamored by that power. Like, for example, you become really, really good at an instrument. Say you become a great, amazing jazz saxophone player. Well, there's going to be an, an aura, like a golden aura. When you play that thing, it's going to show because there's Shakti behind it that's been built up through determination and effort. And yet, if you become enamored with that Shakti, that's what leads you to uh, corruption. You have to be able to say, well, I love the saxophone more than I love the power that comes from becoming a great player, right? This is sort of the point of the Lord of the Rings is that the, the character has to avoid the trap of becoming enamored by the ring of power, which is gradually tempting it and, and pushing its heavy, its weighty burden on it more and more. And, it, and the, the hobbit who carries it has to stay simple and innocent in a sense and can't give in to being enamored or tempted by the power of the ring and then has to cast it into the fire. We've carried something for a long time with Pluto and Capricorn. All of us have in different ways, different parts of our chart. And uh, and maybe we've been enamored at times by the power. Maybe we've had to explore the shadows of, of power and, and, um, and so forth. But as Pluto culminates and the sun goes across Pluto, the two conjoin at the very last degree in the very last minutes of Capricorn, it is time to uh, let go of a process that we've been carrying. It's like the moment where you can cast the ring into the fire and you can say, okay, I've carried something for a while. It's, it's, been a, it's been a duty. It's been a service. I've learned a lot. I've climbed up some mountain or another. And it is time to lay down that burden, that duty, that responsibility. It's time to lay down the approaches I've been taking. It's time to you know, set this burden down, and let it go. And right as we do so, right, there's a, there's something that, that could feel like a loss. It could feel like a moment of um, an era coming to a close, that there's something that is seeking resolution now and that, that, that it's hard to let go of, that there's a kind of a final, you know, a final um, test or something like that. We have to really let go of something. And that's coming through at the end of this week. But again, it's coming through in service of a new vision. I think, for example, in number four here is a new blueprint in the star card. If you think about the tarot or tarot, sorry, I keep saying it that way. Uh, if you think about the tarot, um, the tower card comes first and then the star card. And this is a sequence that I thought a lot about this past fall as um, the cards were coming up in various ways in 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 my own life i thought it's really interesting the tower card implies you know destruction the 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 and that's what we're talking about as pluto and the sun get together in the last degree of capricorn there's a sense of being at the very end of something and it falls something falls apart you know it's like okay done and then what comes next is the star card and the star card in the tarot is in so many ways a, a picture of a new vision a hopeful, bright, progressive vision of what could be, an excitement and an aura of rebirth around that card that's very sacred. And I think that's exactly what we're going through this week as we see so many nice, like the, the Venus square to Neptune, the Mercury trying to Jupiter are both just really moving things in service of something that we're very attracted to, something that we can see in the future on the horizon. And although there is this kind of destructive, weighty moment of release, of transformation that comes uh, at the end of this week with the sun conjoining Pluto in that last degree of Capricorn, the immediate entrance of Pluto into Aquarius with the sun to me is like the star card. It's like the death of a star and the birth of a new star. So what is the higher idea? that's guiding us forward. That is as important as the tangible earthly desires that are taking shape. 
So on the Venusian level, it really has to do with what we're attracted to, what we desire, what we find beautiful, what we find appealing, what gives pleasure or satisfaction to our lives and the way we, that we go about building it. On the other hand, there's something we're laying down and we're also picking up a new vision. There's a new higher idea or ideas or philosophies or um, almost like an, a new archetype that's trying to install itself. I know I don't love the like computer language so much, but it is, it's like a new program because Aquarius is so high minded, right? It's the words like blueprint, paradigm, ideas, archetypes. These are properly Aquarian terms. They're also Saturnian in the sense that Saturn sits at the gateway between what is known and what is conventional and what goes beyond it. And Saturn is so frequently associated with the conventional, you know, in the structure that's not really appropriate for Saturn. Saturn has to do with the juxtaposition and often the polarization between what is conventional and unconventional, what is known or unknown, what is standard versus uh, or the dogma versus the heretic. And Saturn, Saturn is the planet that represents the tension between the two, like a, a, a boundary that sits between the two and that, that, that there's always going to be tension when the two come up. Well, there's a new blueprint coming in right now. And so there could be some tension that comes with it. As we set down an old structure, we start considering something unconventional, a totally new vision. And then finally, just broadly speaking, we're really talking with this airy uh, Pluto and Sun in Aquarius signature alongside of Venus and Neptune squaring and Mercury and Jupiter trining and the earthy moon and Taurus coming through at the, the last second and the gradual moving of Jupiter and Uranus into a conjunction in, around April 20th in Taurus, Venus's sign, the moon's exaltation. Right now, there are new like celestial archetypal mind of God type of ideas, it, the inspiring uh, paradigm changing, revolutionary, taking us across the threshold from what we've done to something we haven't done, that kind of Aquarian shift. But it's in service of things that are very earthy, very sensual, very feminine, you could say, in the world, in the garden, here, you know, embodied. So heaven is meeting earth in this moment. And we're, it's not that it'll all happen right now. It's that the seeds of this, uh, this potential for the union of that the higher minded ideas of Aquarius and the very earthy sensual domain of Jupiter, Uranus and Taurus, we're, we're seeing a seeding moment that's going to ripple out through the rest of this year in, in so many ways, especially through the next six months as Jupiter and Uranus come together in uh, Taurus and, and we have that kind of culmination of Jupiter and Taurus in the spring. So anyway, uh, these are some good ways to start thinking about what's happening. Three major transits all at once, Friday into Saturday. So anyway, I wanted to start today by just kind of giving us the big picture. As the week goes on, we'll start diving into each of these individual aspects and unpacking them in a bit more of a vacuum because it's good to look at them all and then it's good to narrow in and work the archetypal combinations um, in a little bit more compartmentalized fashion. That way we, we can really start differentiating as we also build synthesis. So anyway, that's our goal for uh, the, the rest of this week. And uh, don't forget, we've got some new classes. The Masterclass series starts this week. You can still join in on year three counseling and astrology program. And uh, our Roots and Spheres Moon Circle just started. Need-based tuition is open for any of them. If you have any questions, uh, check out the website and the courses page on the website, nightlightastrology.com. The need-based tuition option is there under each course page. You can always email us, info at nightlightastrology.com. All right, that's it for today. See you tomorrow. Bye.